Hello everyone, today I'm very excited to share with you my new pattern. Now this pattern is something I have been agonizing over, but I finally worked up the courage to put the dress together and share the process with you, so I really hope you like it. Now this pattern is inspired by a gorgeous, gorgeous dress at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and it is the 1809 American Quaker wedding dress, which was worn by Lydia Pulteney and I absolutely adore this dress. Now I'm very eager to continue sharing about the inspiration and the process, so let's get into it. For materials, I will be using about five meters of this light pink Duchess satin with a width of 140 centimeters. I will also be using matching thread, four buttons, and a white string for the drawstring. I will also be making a full mock-up from 3 meters of this pink cotton fabric. The pattern I will be using is available in my Etsy shop and I've added a link to it down below in the description box. After downloading the pattern, you can select the PDF you want and print it on the corresponding paper, US letter or A4. I will be choosing and printing the A4 PDF. When printing, I will check to make sure I am printing all 63 pages and I want the scale at 100% and the print margin set to zero. After printing, I will check the measurements of the square on the first page and then begin assembling. The 63 pages will create a grid that is 9 pages across and 7 pages down for a total of 63 pages. These 63 pages will create the pattern. To assemble the pattern, I will simply cut the margins of the pages as needed and tape the pages together to form the full grid of 63 pages. Again, it is 9 pages across and 7 pages down for a total of 63. And here's what the pattern looks like once assembled. Next, I will choose what size I want to cut my pattern to. You can check the size chart in the instructions PDF for more details, but I will be choosing size 38. The pattern sizes are labeled by the bust size in inches at the fullest point. So, for example, my bust measurement at its fullest point is about 38 inches, so I will be using pattern size 38. I will then cut out the pattern at size 38. After cutting my pattern pieces out, I will make a mock-up of the full dress just to test the fit and length before chopping up my expensive satin. Now I have been enamored with this 1809 American Quaker wedding dress from the Philadelphia Museum of Art for a long, long time. It is one of my favorite extant gowns. I love that this dress is still fashion forward for the time, but is also restrained because of Quaker values. I think that compromise of fashion and religion makes for a very unique gown that highlights the beautiful silhouette of its time. When looking at the image of this dress on the Philadelphia Museum of Art's website, I began to take note of a few things, such as the two darts at the bust, the gathered front neckline, and a deep hem. I also spied two seams for the skirt, which indicated to me a skirt front, skirt side, and skirt back panel. I also like the full and above elbow puff sleeves that seem slightly arched and were finished with a sleeve band. And I couldn't tell exactly, but I don't think there is a side seam for the bodice. And I also wondered if the skirt might have a pad in the back for extra volume. I use these elements to help inspire and create this pattern, and I am pretty happy with how it came out. I do think I will try to save up for some cream silk satin like the Lydia dress and reattempt this pattern again for an even closer recreation. Let me know in the comments if you think I should.
I was pretty pleased with how my mock-up turned out and I think the pattern created a very pretty dress in cotton. I also thought the fit looked good when worn over top my stays, but it could also work over a bra too. As always, I highly recommend you make a mock-up before cutting into your nice dress fabric. A mock-up can save you so much heartache and is a great way to check and perfect the fit of your garment. After testing with the mock-up, I was ready to cut into my duchess satin. When cutting out my fabric pieces, I wanted to be careful and cut them all out in the same direction because my satin does have a certain shine or nap to it. When making the mock-up out of the cotton, I was really able to squeeze every piece out of my fabric. But now I need to be much more particular when cutting my pattern pieces out of my satin. And here are all the pieces I have cut for my dress. I have one skirt back cut on the fold, two skirt side pieces, one skirt front cut on the fold, two sleeves and two sleeve bands, one piece of binding for my skirt back, four bodice strap pieces, two for the outer layer and two for lining, one drawstring casing which is cut on the fold, four bodice back pieces, two for the outer layer and two for the lining, and one bodice front piece cut on the fold. And after cutting everything out, I'm going to straight away finish all the edges with a zigzag stitch. You may prefer to overlock your raw edges or finish them in an entirely different method, but I'm just going to go around all of the edges of my cut pieces and finish them with a zigzag stitch. And after I have finished adding a zigzag stitch to all of the raw edges, I will then take these pieces and iron them flat and smooth so that everything is prepped and ready to be sewn. And here you can see what all of my pieces look like with these zigzag edges and they're all ironed and ready to go so that I can get into constructing and putting together the dress. First, I used chalk to draw in the four darts on my bodice front. After drawing in the darts, I used pins to pin the darts in place, matching the dart legs to one another and pinning them. If you like, you can base the darts to secure before machine stitching. After pinning, I go to my machine and stitch the darts in place. I start at the bottom of the dart and sew upwards, slowly tapering off the bodice. And here's what my darts look like. They sort of appear spread apart right now, but once I add the drawstring to the neckline, it will help the darts appear more parallel. Next, I add a buttonhole to the center front of my drawstring casing. I use a pin and chalk to mark the center front and then I use the buttonhole setting on my machine to stitch a buttonhole in place. This is where the drawstrings will come out so that they can be cinched and tied. After stitching the buttonhole, I use my scissors to cut the buttonhole open. 
and you can finish the edges of the sewn buttonhole with fray check. And alternatively, you can sew an eyelet by hand for the drawstrings. I will now add the drawstring casing to my bodice front. I'm going to match and stitch the drawstring casing to my bodice front. With right sides together, I will match the top edge of my drawstring casing to the topped curved edge of my bodice front. I want to make sure these center fronts are matching and my buttonhole on the casing is perfectly centered. I will pin these two edges together and then stitch, sewing with one centimeter of seam allowance. Next, I will fold the drawstring casing over two times. I will first fold over the drawstring casing to the wrong side of my bodice front, and then I will fold the bottom edge under, hiding it within the casing, and I will pin the casing in place. This will create a channel for the drawstring. I will fold the drawstring casing over two times and pin all along the neckline, and as I work, I want to make sure that the casing doesn't become twisted or warped. I'm going to work slowly and carefully, folding and pinning as I go. Next, I will stitch my casing in place. I want to stitch close to the folded bottom edge of my drawstring casing. I have now created a channel for my drawstrings. So the next thing to do is insert my drawstrings into this created casing. I will use a safety pin to feed my white drawstrings into the casing and then stitch my drawstrings in place to secure them at either end of the casing. I now have two drawstrings, one on either side that can meet in the middle and be cinched and tied. After adding the drawstrings, I like to use a safety pin and pin them out of the way so that I don't accidentally sew over them when working later on. Next, I'm going to stitch my bodice front to my bodice back. I will match the curved side edges of the bodice front to the curved edge of my bodice back with right sides together. I pin these curved edges to one another and then stitch. Now that I've added my bodice back to my bodice front, the next thing to do is add the straps. Now this part can be a bit confusing, so work slowly and check your cut pieces against the pattern to make sure you've got the right side of the strap sewn to the right side of the bodice. If you look at the bodice front and the strap, you will see two gray dots. These gray dots will indicate the side of the strap that should be joined to the bodice front. And if you match the strap to the bodice back, you will see the size label numbers on the same side. Hopefully this will help you keep the strap matched to the correct bodice piece. So now I'm going to add the straps to my bodice back. And I take care to match the correct edges together and pin with right sides touching. I also match my remaining two strap pieces to my two remaining bodice back pieces. The two strap pieces and two bodice back pieces will create a partial bodice lining. The straps and bodice back are lined, but the bodice front is not. That is so the gathers won't be too bulky. So now I have matched four straps to four bodice backs, and I now machine stitch these edges together.
Next, I'm going to match the partial lining to the back of my bodice. I'm going to match the neckline edges and the center back edges to one another and pin, making sure that right sides are together. And then I'm going to stitch these edges together, sewing along the neckline and center back. When I get to the corner, I like to keep the needle in my machine down and lift the foot up. And then I simply pivot the fabric to turn. I then put the foot down and continue sewing. Now this next part might seem confusing, but I promise it will work out. I have just sewn along the center back edge and neckline edge of my bodice back and strap joining the partial lining to the bodice back and strap. So one strap side is going to be the lining and the other side is the outside layer of my bodice. I want to make sure that my bodice lining is kept free and is not stitched to anything at this point. So I want to keep it out of the way. I will now match the strap to my bodice front with right sides together. I will be matching the outer layer strap to my bodice front and I will pin these two edges together and stitch. Take care here to make sure your strap doesn't become twisted and make sure you're stitching the strap outer layer, not the lining. And this is how it should look. And now my bodice is ready for sleeves. For the sleeves, I'm going to start by adding a row of long length gathering stitches to the sleeve head and the bottom edge of the sleeve. Next, I'm going to gather down the bottom edge of my sleeve so that it is the same length as my sleeve band. I will simply pull the loose threads of my gathering line of stitches to gather down the bottom edge of my sleeve. And I want to focus the bulk of my gathers at the center of my sleeve. Next, I pin my sleeve band to my sleeve with the right side of my sleeve band facing the wrong side of my sleeve. And I pin the bottom edges to one another. Then I stitch my sleeve band to my sleeve, stitching carefully over top my created gathers. Next, I fold my sleeve band over two times. I fold the bottom edge of my sleeve band up to hide the raw bottom edge and then I fold it one more time to lay over top and cover my gathers. I pin my sleeve band in place and position the folded edge over top my gathers to hide my previous stitching. After pinning my sleeve band in place, I go to the machine and top stitch my sleeve band down, stitching closely to the folded edge. This creates a nice finished edge to the sleeve 
and I go back and give the sleeve band a second line of stitching to mimic the extant gown. And here's what my sleeves look like so far. Next, I fold my sleeves in half with right sides touching and pin the side edges to one another and then stitch. Now the sleeves are ready to be set into the armhole of the bodice. Now this can be a little bit tricky because the seam for the sleeve and the side seam for the bodice are set into the back. You want to make sure that you have the correct sleeve matched to the correct side of the bodice. This curved dip part of the sleeve should be at the underarm with the full round portion of the sleeve head at the top of the shoulder. And the side seam for the sleeve should be matched to the side seam of the bodice at the back. So to start fitting my sleeve into my bodice's armhole, I will first make sure my bodice lining is out of the way. I will have to be mindful of this the entire time when adding my sleeve. Next, I will start by matching the sleeve side seam to the bodice side seam and pinning these two together. Then I work around the underarm of my sleeve, pinning it smoothly and neatly to the armhole. As I reach the top shoulder of my bodice, the bodice's strap, I will now begin gathering down the sleeve head so that it fits. I will simply pull the loose threads of my gathering line of stitches that I added to the sleeve head so that the gathers of the sleeve head gather down and I will gently push the gathers until I'm happy with the placement and then pin it in place, the gathered sleeve head into the top shoulder of my armhole. I think here you can see how the bottom portion of my armhole has the sleeve fitted smooth into it. And the top shoulder area of my armhole has the sleeve head that's been gathered down to fit. Now I condensed my gathers down to fit about 9 centimeters. So starting from the bodice back to strap seam and going up over the shoulder, those 9 centimeters is where I have focused all the sleeve head gathers. On my mock-up, I did about 13 centimeters, and I think in hindsight, I prefer the 13 centimeters. Anyways, I repeat this for my other sleeve, and then I stitch my sleeves into my armhole, taking care as I sew over top the gathers to make sure the placement is good. Again, I also want to take care to make sure I'm not catching my lining. And here you can see that my lining remains free and how the sleeve looks. Next, I'm going to set the bodice aside for a quick moment and work on the skirt for my dress. First, I'm going to add binding to the center back slit on my back skirt piece. On the skirt back piece, there is indicated on the pattern where to cut the slit. You want this slit in the center back of your dress so that you can get in and out of your dress. I have finished this raw edge with a zigzag stitch, but I am now going to add binding, and I will be using my binding pattern piece to create a tidy edge. Before I add the binding, I like to cut the tiniest little Y shape. I think this makes opening up this edge and adding the binding easier. Next, I pin the binding with the right side facing the wrong side of my skirt. After pinning, I stitch, and then I fold the binding over two times the first time to conceal the binding's raw edge, and the second time to cover the seam. After pinning it in place, I top stitch it. And this creates a tiny finished edge for the center back of my skirt. Once this is finished, I continue on assembling my skirt. To assemble the skirt, I match my skirt side pieces to my skirt back with right sides touching. I pin and stitch, and then I like to press this seam open. Next, I match my skirt front to my skirt sides, again matching with right sides together and stitching. 
Once again, I press this seam open. Now all the edges of my skirt have been sewn together. And after my skirt has been assembled, I can now attach it to the bodice. I will match my bodice to the skirt along the waist edge and I want to keep right sides touching. I will start by using a pin to mark the center front of the bodice and the center front of the skirt. I will then match these two center fronts together and pin. Starting at the center front, I will work down either side of the bodice, pinning the waist edge of the bodice smooth against the waist edge of the skirt. I want to keep the skirt smooth and flush against the bodice as I pin. Once I reach the back bodice piece, I will then take the remaining skirt and pleat it down to fit the skirt back piece. This does take some time and care since I want my pleats to be symmetrical and even on both sides of my bodice back. The center back edge of your skirt should perfectly line up with the center back of the bodice. And again, you want to keep the bodice lining free as you pin the skirt to the bodice. And here you can see what it looks like once I've pinned my skirt waist edge to my bodice waist edge. You can see that the skirt is smooth against the bodice until the bodice back pieces. And there I have pleated down the remaining skirt so that it fits. And that center back edge of my skirt that we finished with binding is nestled into the seam where the center back edges of my bodice are joined to the partial lining. Once I am satisfied with the placement of my pleats and my skirt has been pinned into my bodice, I will then go to the machine and stitch my skirt to my bodice all along the waist edge. Again, as I sew, I want to take care and make sure I am not catching my lining as I stitch. Once my skirt has been sewn to my bodice along the waist edge, I can finally turn my bodice lining so that I have finished edges along the neckline and center back. First, I trim the corner of the lining to make turning easier and then I turn it right side out and press the edges. Now we can begin the finishing touches for the dress. First, I pin my lining to the seam allowance of my dress. The lining is only a partial lining and only covers the bodice back and straps. I fold the seam allowance inward at the front of the strap and pin it in place. I fold the edges inward and pin the lining to the seam allowance, making sure to match the seams as I pin the lining to the bodice at the seam allowance. And then I begin the task of hand sewing the lining to the bodice. As I hand stitch, I take care to make sure I'm only catching the seam allowance of my bodice as I stitch my lining to the bodice. I don't want any of my stitching to accidentally show on the outer layer. So I just take extra care to make sure I'm only sewing into the seam allowance. I will hand sew the bodice back and strap along the waist edge, bodice side back seam, and top of the shoulder to attach the lining to the bodice's seam allowance. While this is a bit time consuming, it does create a tidy finished look to the garment. Next, I use pins and chalk to mark my buttonhole placement. 
and then I sew four buttonholes to the center back of my bodice. After stitching, I carefully cut the buttonholes open. Then I hand stitch four buttons in place for the back closure of my dress. And with my back closure added, I try on my dress and decide on a hem length. First, I use an iron to press the bottom edge of my skirt up about one centimeter. Then I stitch the folded edge down using a long length stitch. This will help me ease my hem up later. Here you can see the safety pin I use to mark where I'd like my dress bottom edge to be. I use this safety pin to help me measure and mark with chalk my hem length around the entire bottom edge of my dress. I mark about 7 centimeters up from the bottom edge of my dress and use this as a guide to fold up and pin the bottom edge of my dress in place. After pinning everything in place, I used a blind stitch to stitch the hem in place. I pull the basting stitches to help ease the curved bottom edge into place as I work around the entire bottom edge of the skirt. After hand stitching my hem, I press the bottom with an iron and I think it looks pretty good. I would not say that hand stitching is a strong point for me, but I am pretty satisfied. Now the final thing I'm going to do is make a tiny little pad for the back of my dress. This should help add a little extra volume and poof to the center back pleats and mimic the 1809 dress. I simply stitch the sides of my two pieces together leaving room to turn. Then I turn it right side out and stuff it and I stuff it using scrap fabric. Next I hand stitch the gap shut. Then I attach it to the center back of my dress. I added an elastic loop and a button, but in hindsight I wish I had added ribbons to tie it in place instead. And with that, my dress is complete. I want to share a little footage of my dress on the mannequin and then some warm footage, but I'm overall happy with the finished dress and I think this pattern does a good job capturing some of my favorite elements from the 1809 American Quaker wedding dress. I am tempted to try this again but maybe next time I will find a gorgeous silk satin for an even closer recreation. Still, I think this dress came out very nice and I like how historically inspired it is. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. Thank you.
and thank you so much for watching this video. If you like this video and would like to see other fun DIY videos, then definitely like and subscribe. Thank you. Bye.